G'day folks and welcome again to Loud and Dirty, where we explore the history of guitar distortion and feedback in recorded music. Now I plan to jump straight into the year 1965, but a UK subscriber by the name of Roy Goad has been making a national sport out of catching me out on songs that I should have included in previous episodes. So I need to do a bit of housekeeping before we jump ahead. Now in the last episode I pointed out that as far as I was aware, a certain girl by the Yardbirds featuring Eric Clapton contained the first transistor based fuzz distortion on a British recording. Six weeks prior to the release of that Yardbird single, a version of the Bill Haley and the Comets tune Skinny Mini came out by a band called Carter Lewis and the Southerners. The lead guitarist of this band was a young man by the name of Jimmy Page and he was the very first recipient of a Roger Mayer homemade fuzz box. Well, a do I love her, does a boy love oh, she's the Released on March 27, 1964, this, as far as I know, is the first British record to contain a solid state guitar fuzz tone. But old mate Roy wasn't finished with me yet. In his comments under my last video, he mentioned a name that immediately made me go, oh yes, of course. And that name is Joe Meek. The word genius is bandied around far too often when it comes to pop music, and I'm as guilty as anyone in overusing the term. But when it comes to electronic innovation in pop music production, Joe Meek is in a class all by himself. We've just heard a bit of Telstar by the Tornadoes from back in 1962. Composed and produced by Joe Meek, it was the first British single to top the US Billboard charts and all recorded in a three-story flat above a leather goods shop in Holloway Road, Islington, North London. Meek had been fascinated by electronics from a very early age and became a radar technician in the Royal Air Force before getting into record production. He was the first independent British record producer to really upset the major labels by beating them at their own game, and while he did produce several major hits, he also worked with some oddball acts as well. And there was none more oddball than Screaming Lord Such and the Savages. <laughs> Before Marilyn Manson, before Alice Cooper, before the crazy world of Arthur Brown, David's screaming Lord Such was a pioneering example of what we now call shock rock. What he may have lacked in vocal talent, he more than made up for in stage theatrics. Many of his songs had a horror theme, and this song, Dracula's Daughter, is no exception. When the moon shone bright, I was fast in the cemetery. When a bite on the cheek left me feeling weak, that's where I met Vampire Mary. <laughs> I'd assume that the fuzz box used on this recording would have been one built by Meek himself. Fuzz units contain fairly simple circuitry for those who know what they're doing, and for someone like Joe Meek, building a fuzz box would have been like making a cup of tea. The fuzz effect on the single's B-side, Come Back Baby, is even more prominent. Another one of Joe Meek's productions from 1964 was of a teenage band called the Blue Rondos from his own suburb of Islington. Go 
Baby I Go For You features some scorching fuzz tone and a ripping lead solo by the band's guitarist Roger Hall. Unfortunately, Joe Meek's story is one that ultimately ended in violent tragedy, so if you don't know much about him, he's well worth reading up about. They even made a feature film about his life called Telstar, starring Con O'Neill in the title role and featuring James Corden and Kevin Spacey. I'll put links to some Joe Meek stuff in the description box below. And that's finally it for 1964. Special thanks go to Roy Goad for getting in contact, pointing me in the right direction and showing some interest in what we're trying to do here. I really appreciate that, Roy, so good on you. And now we can finally do this. 1965. 1965 was the year that rock and roll music became simply rock. But so much happened that this is just part one of two episodes of one absolutely phenomenal year. So when we left you last time, the Kinks had just released a couple of killer singles that put heavy power chord guitar riffs on the map, thanks to a little green amplifier that guitarist Dave Davies had subtly modified with a razor blade to the speaker code. And even when the band went into ballad mode, those familiar fuzzed out chords were never far away. highest ever US chart placing. One particular songwriter who really felt the shockwaves of what the Kinks were doing was 19 year old Pete Townsend. His band The Who had briefly changed their name to the High Numbers and released a single that, while kind of cute and appealing in its own way, was ultimately unsuccessful and didn't really represent who they were. Taking a far more direct approach and even using the same producer that the Kinks had, I Can't Explain with its punchy three chord motif was a top ten hit and the band were on their way. And while the A side was not particularly heavy sounding, the B side, Bald Headed Woman, was an old folk song that US producer Shell Tell Me conveniently managed to turn into his own composition thanks to it being in the public domain. I don't want no bald headed woman. She didn't mean love, 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 she do mean. He'd already forced it onto the Kinks, who did a spectacularly lame version on their self titled debut album. I don't want no bald headed woman. Gonna make me me, yes, love, it make me me. So now it was the Who's turn to suffer. Tell Me suggested a fuzz guitar effect for the song, but Townsend didn't own a fuzz box. No problem, Tell Me's trusty session guitarist mate, Jimmy Page, had his Roger Mayer homemade unit at the ready. But Page didn't want to hand it to Pete Townsend. So as a result, we've got the kind of unique and extremely cool situation of Jimmy Page playing guitar with the Who, even if it is pretty much just one chord throughout the entire song. Make me me, yeah, oh, make me me. Yeah, I don't want no shit in my coffin. Page was one very busy bloke in early 1965. His session work was going through the roof and his little fuzz unit was coming in handy. One session saw him sitting in with a band called the Manish Boys, a group who had too much hair for the BBC. Well, I pity the fool. I said I pity the fool. The song was I Pity the Fool, written by the group's 17 year old singer and alto saxophonist. His name was David Jones. He later became known as David Bowie. Page 
Page's fuzz lead guitar solo was particularly fine on this recording. You can really hear the beginnings of Led Zeppelin even at this early stage. One of Jimmy Page's more bizarre recording sessions in early 1965 was doing an album called Kinky Music by the Larry Page Orchestra. This was an instrumental album of Kink's songs, produced by Larry Page. Now, Larry Page was no relation to Jimmy Page, by the way. In fact, his real name was Lawrence Davies, but he's not related to the Davies brothers either. Anyway, it's interesting how only a few months previously, You Really Got Me had stunned the music world with its super aggressive tone, and yet already it's been reinvented as virtual elevator music. hear stuff like this you can really understand why within a year Jimmy Page would be completely over session work. The kinks themselves would soon change, swapping volume for social commentary and lyrical introspection, but in May they gave the old homemade distortion setup one more outing with Set Me Free. Like Tired of Waiting For You, it was basically You Really Got Me but slowed down, but the B-side was Vintage Kinks, and this time with a bit of feedback thrown in for good measure. I Need You became the second song in history that I know of to contain deliberate guitar feedback after the Beatles' I Feel Fine. Well, actually it turned out to be a tie for equal second because on the very same day, May 21st, 1965, The Who released their follow-up single to I Can't Explain. But first we have to talk about guitar amplifiers because while the Kinks had used a tiny 10 watt thing to get their huge sound onto tape, The Who were using bigger and bigger amps to get louder on stage. Like, seriously loud. Enter the Marshall Stack. Pete Townsend had formed a close relationship with Jim Marshall's music store in Hanwell, West London. Marshall was originally a jazz drummer who became a drum teacher. He then opened up a musical instrument store but soon found that the demand for amplifiers was the main issue for a lot of musicians. So in 1962, he began to manufacture guitar amps himself. Initially based on Fender circuitry, but due to the different available components and voltage etc. in the UK, Jim Marshall's amplifiers had different characteristics to the American models. Couple this with the demand for more volume, Marshall amplifiers very quickly got bigger and bigger. More wattage, more speakers, more volume. But what occurs when you have an electric guitar going into a loud amp where the speaker is pretty much at the exact height of your guitar pickup, what comes out of the amp is then going straight back into your pickup and this causes an infinite loop known as feedback. But players such as Pete Townsend were beginning to discover that you could actually harness feedback control it somewhat and make it work for you. Feedback could almost be an instrument in itself. Now the Who were also a major part of a working class subculture known as mod. Mods were fond of scooters, sharp Italian style suits, American soul and R&B music, short haircuts, army surplus parkers and certain pharmaceuticals that gave you <clears throat> energy, shall we say. Townsend wanted to capture the freedom and rebellion of the mod lifestyle and he, along with Who vocalist Roger Daltrey in a one-off co-write, came up with Any Way, Any How, Anywhere. I can go anywhere, where I choose. The record was a second straight top 10 hit for The Who, and the song was briefly used as the theme tune to the popular TV music program Ready Steady Go, but it's the middle section that's particularly interesting. In an 
attempt to recreate the volume and edginess of a Who live gig, and also because he was just a bit of an arty sod, Pete Townsend opted for feedback and mayhem in the instrumental section rather than a conventional guitar solo. It made the Beatles' feedback intro to I Feel Fine sound positively genteel by comparison. In fact, the sound was so unconventional that when Decca Records in the US received the master tapes for the single, they got back to the UK company to say that there was some sort of fault in the master. No, it's just feedback. Get over it. In the last episode, we talked about the Yardbirds being one of the earliest adopters of fuzz tone. Well, they were going through some changes. After the relative failure of their first two singles, the band turned to a happening teenage songwriter named Graham Gouldman. Gouldman had written this odd little song with Baroque overtones and choppy time changes, and the Yardbirds, well, four-fifths of the band at least, absolutely loved it. For Your Love! For Your Love became a huge pop hit, causing their blues-obsessed lead guitarist Eric Clapton to leave the group over what he saw as commercialism over musical integrity. Now, the idea of replacing a guitarist as great as Clapton would seem to be an almost impossible task. Not really. Two words. Jeff Beck. Beck was not the blues purist that Eric Clapton was. In fact, he was up for anything. In many ways, Clapton leaving the Yardbirds would end up being a win-win situation for all concerned. The Yardbirds now had their ideal lead guitarist, and Eric Clapton was free to pursue his own blues odyssey. After the success of the exotic sounding For Your Love, Graham Gouldman presented another song to the band, Heart Full of Soul. This tune suggested Eastern, Indian sounds, so when the Yardbirds came to record the song, an actual sitar player was hired for the session. But the sitar just didn't cut it, the sound was too thin and weedy, so the band turned to their new recruit to pull something out of his hat. Well, Jeff Beck did pull something out of his gear bag, one of Roger Mayer's homemade fuzz boxes, given to him by his good friend Jimmy Page. But by the time the band returned to the studio to record the song properly, Jeff Beck was now in possession of a wooden fuzz unit known as a tone bender. And believe me, there will be plenty more about the tone bender in the following episode. Released on June the 4th, 1965, Heartful of Soul was a smash hit. The Yardbirds were well and truly back in business, and Raga Rock was born. Well, if she had me back again, well, I would never make her sad. I got a Just 24 hours after Heartful of Soul first hit record stores in the UK, another single by a British band was released in the States, and it too contained a main riff played through a fuzz box. But this record would go on to change everything. But first, do you remember this from the last episode? It's mellow, it's raucous, it's tender, it's raw, it's the maestro fuzz tone. You have to hear this completely different sound effect for the guitar to believe it. Ah yes, the poor old maestro fuzz tone. Unloved, unsold, semi-forgotten in fact. There's one thing I failed to mention about the maestro in the last episode, and that is that when they first went on sale in 1962, they cost 40 US dollars a unit. Now 40 bucks back in 1962 was a substantial amount of money, especially for something that was a completely unknown quantity. And the sound is that of a cello. <laughs> So the only people who bought these things tended to be either high-end session musicians or else someone in charge of a recording studio. So it's little wonder that the maestro fuzz tone failed to fly at first. But then this happened. Rolling Stones guitarist Keith Richards came up with the riff late one night, played it into his little cassette recorder and then promptly fell asleep. The remainder of the tape contained nothing but him snoring. 
When he and co-writer Mick Jagger presented it to be recorded, Richards felt that the main riff should be played by a horn section. So when the Stones recorded I Can't Get No Satisfaction at the RCA Studios in Hollywood, California, there was a maestro fuzz tone pedal in the studio. Richards recorded his sketch of an idea of the horn part using the maestro, expecting that some real brass would eventually replace it. But producer Andrew Luke Oldham, engineer David Hassinger and the rest of the band all thought that the record sounded great as it was, so it became the Rolling Stones' next US single, shooting straight to the top of the charts. Hey, hey, hey. Firstly, Satisfaction would not be released as a single in the UK for another two months, but the result was ultimately the same. Number one all the way. And within a few months, you couldn't buy a Maestro Fuzz Tone. They were completely sold out. So by the end of the year, an updated model was released and 40,000 units were immediately shipped. Now let's just get back to the mods for one second. While The Who had been a band that found themselves being drawn into the mod subculture, there was a new London group who'd been mods before becoming a band. In fact, the very name of this group, The Small Faces, was a mod reference. A face was the fashion leader in any local scene, the guy who was one step ahead of everyone else. And Small came about because these guys were tiny. Steve Marriott played a Gretsch guitar that was almost as big as him. I want you to know that I love you, baby. I want you to know that I care. I'm so happy when you're around me, but I'm sad when you're not The Small Faces sound was generally more soul oriented than The Who, but Marriott was another early convert to the Marshall stack. And during the recording of the band's debut single, What You Gonna Do About It, he cranked his Marshall up, stood right in front of it and let wail. What you gonna do about it? Now with two top 10 hits under their belt, The Who were flying, and for their third single, songwriter Pete Townsend came up with one of the greatest rock anthems of all time. Taking the basic theme of mod rebellion from the previous single, Townsend honed this idea and crafted it into a perfect gem. Both the two chord main riff and ascending modal shifts show a continuing Kinks influence. The idea of the bass solo was pure genius. But the coda is where it's all happening, and this is where the story of guitar feedback really starts. Those clattering drums, the energy, this is the real beginning of loud rock music. And we're going to leave it there for now. So join me for episode number four where we continue with the year 1965. We'll be checking back in with our friends in the United States and see how they were travelling during this phenomenal year. So make sure you subscribe, hit the notification bell and bye for now.